everybody. It's Dr. Rick uh, dropping back in on you to close out. Well, I don't know if we're going to close out, but we're definitely going to close the circle on this epigenetics and uh, multigenerational trauma uh, conversation. Um, one of the people commented on the session I did yesterday on tr multigenerational trauma and the research I've done, especially in the area of epigenetics. And they said this epigenetics thing is deep. Uh, and I said, man, it, it goes so much more deeper and I want to kind of bring your focus to it. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, especially in the area where it impacts our kids and adverse childhood experience. But I'm also going to talk about, to a certain extent, how it impacts us in our own health and the proclivities for our health outcomes as adults. And so uh, what you're seeing uh, streamed in, in, in little intervals throughout this conversation is going to be clips from a workshop I did on epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, multigenerational transmission of trauma, and how it impacts children in the household, and specifically sort of worked into uh, my work with the Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, and Wellspring Clinic in uh, helping to reduce recidivism. Uh, which is a major contributor to adverse childhood experiences. It's one of the 10 um, ACEs. So I'm going to start uh, by reading again. Reading is what's going to help us actually get clarity and keep me from being all over the place. You're talking to a person who's literally put nearly 30 years into this one particular thing and understanding it. And so the conversations can be vast. They're literally pa papers I've written over uh, 200 pages on this topic multiple papers on it and epigenetics and psychology epigenetics and science and uh what's that adverse childhood experiences uh just looking at some of the files now and so i could just ramble for days and so i want to keep it precise and i want to make these points and i put it in the book uh born in captivity psychopathology as a legacy of slavery so i'm going to just kind of close the loop and tell you why it is immensely important for us to really get a handle on this more research is definitely necessary uh, a, a greater understanding is necessary one of the things is that's going to be a young brother which uh with a uh, brazen dreads in his head you'll see him in one of these photos he's actually a psychiatrist in therapy he heard that i was going to be at this clinic and he literally made it his point to come out and sit underneath it and sit up and learn and connect uh, which is huge. Uh, those are the guys that I'm going to pass this down to male or female, the younger generation who has the passion to, and understanding to know that we can't just sit up and wish this stuff away. So this chapter is chapter eight in the book and it's called Racial Trauma and, and African Americans. And then the subtopic is African Americans understanding how racial trauma impacts them. Uh, I'm, gonna read, I'm not reading the whole chapter. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts, and then I'm going to take you to a report I wrote, and then um, we're going to break it down real quick, and I'll be done. But I want you to really get this. Um, again, if you like what you hear us in, in these videos, click the like button. Click the share button. If you're not, have you ever already subscribed, subscribe. If you really believe in the work I do, support the work I do and donate. But we've got work to do, one way or the other. So let's go. A substantial amount of my research and studies have been dedicated to understand the collective dysfunctionality of African Americans. I have analyzed and developed theories to explain the behavior of African Americans as it pertains to the general inability to effectively respond to opportunities in life or to guard against the nefarious pestilential machinations that are designed to perpetuate a substandard of existence for them. I have invested much into the understanding of the influence of cognitive distortions and cognitive biases on the social mobility and pathological behavior of large of the, a large portion of the African American community. In addition to anatomizing the paradigms of post-traumatic slave syndrome, thank you, Dr. Joy DeGru, I have developed several theories that rest along the lines of cognitive theory. The first theory I developed was the collective cognitive bias reality theory, which is a theory that seeks to explain the way cognitive distortions influence how blacks think, process stimuli, form habits, and behave through a systematic process of deviated rationalization, serving to create a reality that is repugnant to the one that they actually desire or seek. 
Subsequently, I developed a collective cognitive uh, bias theory to explain the dominance of the influence distorted cognitions have in governing the entire existence of a significant number of African Americans. Most recently, I developed the cognitive assimilation deficiency theory and the cognitive accommodation deficiency theory to explain the inability of African Americans to successfully engage neoteric stimuli that they perceive to be a threat. What I have discovered during the process of my work is that there are common denominators that cannot be ignored. The common denominator is trauma. The birth of three new branches of science. I actually read this part yesterday. The birth of three new branches of science has led to a recent explosion in knowledge about how uh, the effects of psychological trauma impact humans. These new schools of scientific study are neuroscience, the study of how the brain supports mental processes, developmental psychology, the study of the impact of adverse experiences on the de development of the mind and brain, and interpersonal neurobiology, the study of how our behavior influences emotions, biology, and mindsets of those around us. In other words, it's not just influencing us. When we are not right, our behavior is having a mental neurological and biological process, uh, impact on those around us, especially our children. What we now know, uh, what we now know is that trauma, regardless of type or origin, compromises the brain area that communicates the natural, physical, embodied feeling of being alive. These changes in the brain explain why traumatized individuals become hypervigilant in perceiving threats at the expense of being able to live their lives in a spontaneous manner. These changes also help us understand why traumatized people so often keep repeating the same problems and why they have such trouble learning from experience. What was once believed to be the results of moral failing, signs of the lack of willpower or bad character is due to the changes in the brain caused by traumatic experiences. The principal aim of psychology is develop is to develop an understanding of the individual variation in the functioning of humans using broad hypotheses, theories, and research that is capable of not only explaining the variations in human behavior, but creating the mechanisms and instruments through which we can predict poor behavior to intervene in a manner that palliates or even reverses the behavior. While the average person will view variation in human behavior as coincidence or as abstract as an abstract anomaly, the psychologist or the inherent analytical thinker always believes that there is a discoverable and measurable explanation for every occurrence. While we may not always be able to readily identify the origin of the behavior, we understand that the causality is discoverable. When it comes to the counterproductive and antisocial behavior of African Americans, it has been the common practice to study it as a pathological behavior. In other words, it has most commonly been examined under the model of psychopathology. However, I have discovered that while pathology must be investigated when discovering, when studying and developing treatments for antisocial behavior, the trauma model which does not place an emphasis on pathology, is able to explain both poor and pulmonary responses to stressful and traumatic events. Additionally, the trauma model also offers suggestions about the best methods of intervention to efficaciously address and improve functionality after a traumatic event. More importantly, the majority of these intervention models are cost-effective and non-stigmatizing. Now, that's from the book. So basically what you're getting to see and understand here is there are explanations for the behavior. What is commonly called culture is actually a behavior. Created by uh, traumatic experiences, multi-generational experiences, the ability to literally impact those around us and, and in so doing um, create mindsets and neurobiological uh, uh, impacted behavior. And so we can go on and on. One of the things that I have pushed and talked about for I don't know how long is that in the Eurocentric uh vein of psychology the focus is on the 
clumping of system I mean uh, excuse me symptoms to diagnose so it's 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 not an exact science in that you go to the DSM-5 and there's this symptom that symptom that symptom that symptom and if it has at least six of the ten symptoms or four of the six symptoms or whatever that particular diagnosis is then that's what you diagnose them with and then there could be things that from a neurobiological neurobiological uh from a neurological uh uh set of circumstances that could be something literally wrong with the brain and we have actually found that uh, Dr. Daniel A. Mann has done a great deal of work in using scans to determine why someone went from being a very docile calm individual to being uh, violent or moving from a very uh, controlled individual to all of a sudden becoming very whatever uh, and come to find out that a lot of times it can be things that are going on from a neurological perspective, from an actual brain injury, brain lesions, a bunch of other different things that is rarely considered when we're talking about psychological evaluations. And we haven't even got into the spectrum of trauma. We haven't got into the spectrum of adverse childhood experiences. We haven't got into why it's so easy to evaluate our children and label them with oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, or being in some ways on the spectrum when truth and matter is, it could be simply as something, it could be something as simple as they're suffering from adverse childhood experiences and they are acting out based off of the neurobiological influences. And so, um, we're almost done. Um, I explained most of this yesterday. So basically over the last 30 years, I started to uh, do research because there was this school of thought that I'm, I'm going to paraphrase most of this so that I don't have to read it. There's a school of thought back in the 90s that was really coming up. You know, hey, look, it's been 100 plus years. Y'all, it's time to get over it. Tired of hearing about this slavery stuff. Let it go. Slavery's over with. Time to let it go. Time to move on. Now, the one thing that I noticed, first of all, in doing this research is I came across uh, some little studies that had to do with uh, Jewish Holocaust survivors. I told you this yesterday. And the first thing is, you're not going to tell Jewish people to forget about the Holocaust. That was a 12-year event. We're talking about 246 years of child slavery. We're talking 12 years of Reconstruction. We're talking another 15, 20 years of black codes, convict leasing, 75 years of Jim Crow segregation, 50 years of uh, mass incarceration, uh, gentrification, uh, Syria forced displacement, and, and I can go on down the line. Okay, and it's been re-injury after re-injury after re-injury, and we've never even dealt with the first injury yet. And people are saying, get over it. But you need empirical and pragmatic evidence of what you're saying. It can't just be an abstract idea. It needs to go from uh, concept to hypothesis to theory and hopefully theorem that you can literally show, hey, look, you can literally track this stuff. It's real. It, it, it is uh, uh, statistically significant. And we'll, we'll be on statistical significance when it comes to the impact of trauma on the lives of blacks as a collective. But anyway, what I did find is that in in looking at some of these studies, there was this one instance in which um, there was a report of the grandchildren and great grandchildren of uh, Holocaust survivors literally having dreams about experiences their grandparents and great grandparents had during the Holocaust that their great grandparents had not and grandparents had not shared with them. And these dreams were pretty accurate. And so that was a cause of concern. So they did uh, research and epigenetics has been studied for a while, more in the line of environmental stress. But we start to look at the ability to literally genetically imprint your your, 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 your trauma. So what happens is the body keeps the score. I keep telling you that. Um, Dr. Basil Bandekoke is probably the foremost expert in trauma. And he actually has a book called The Body Keeps the Score. But the body keeps the score in that it literally records your trauma. It's not just a mental process. It not, it's not just what is happening uh, emotionally, mentally, what you're processing here. The body is literally recording the event in the stress way and it's creating genetic tags. These genetic tags are called epigenetic tags. These tag literally, tags literally hold the entire memory of the event. 
And what happens is in the uh, you have two types of two primary types of cellu uh, cell cellular reproduction. You have what's known as mitosis. Mitosis is the normal uh, form of uh, cellular rep uh, reproduction in which one cell produces two new cells that's identical to itself before it dies off. That's mitosis in simple explanation. Uh, now uh, the um, regenerative or reproductive uh, system has an entirely different process of cellular reproduction called meiosis. Meiosis goes through a little bit more of a process and in that it it, it, it is supposed to wash away a lot of the, the ge genetic imprinting uh, so that each child, so in other words what happens with procreation? 23 chromosomes from the mom, 23 chromosomes from dad come together, they procreate, create 46 chromosomes which makes new new child those chromosomes bring in the entire DNA sequence that determines everything from hair color, eye color, height, uh, disposition, uh, you know, introvert, extra, all of these different things are going to be written in this code. This code is sequentially laid out. Now, while epigenetics, which is the influence on these genes that are there, that are reading, and that's, epigenetics doesn't change the code. Epigenetics changes how each gene reads the code because the code is there to tell each gene what to do. The code is to tell and suppress disease genes. It is to elevate and upregulate uh, immune genes. It is to help process everything that makes life uh, be, uh, be experienced at its height. The problem is the more stress interferes, the more that uh, the imprint of these epigenetic tags come into play but here's the thing the epigenetic tags are what's left behind after the meiotic process where the reproductive system is supposed to wash it away sometimes traumatic tags are so emphatic so imprinted that they are not completely washed away so then they are literally genetically passed down to the child the child is literally born with trauma uh, sitting on top of their genes genes and it's impacting how their genes are interpreting their uh, the, the DNA. So the DNA is trying to influence and give instruction to the body on what to do, how to become it, whatever. You can get all kind of maladaptive development because of the gene that's been passed down epigenetically. Okay, now that's on the front end. Then there's the back end of experiences. Experiences also create the imprint, right? And this was learned uh, by studying identical twins. You get two twins who are identical. You can't tell them apart early in life. But what happens is as their lives change and they go in different directions and their experiences change, the more they start to look differently. Why? Because the more their environment starts to have an impact on how they're growing, how they're aging, how healthy they are, and so much more. So then you can literally see it play out. One, one, one twin in an extreme situation, one twin lives a very happy life, married, uh, kids and everything. The other one goes through a process of a couple of divorces, gets sick, and then all of a sudden you start to see the sicknesses kick in. And, you know, the, the natural go-to is you're not eating right, uh, you, you're exposed to carcinogens, and a lot of times that is the reverse. It's that I have become sick because of the stress. And because of the stress, I'm not focusing on my health. And a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, and I'm going to get into some of the statistics and the numbers that come along with this epigenetics. But what we find out is um, I got so deeply in this, and I'm going to start reading here. What I discovered, what what I would discover would uh, so much more would be so much more than the potency to project trauma genetically. I was looking for. You know, okay, it's being passed down, but it's so much uh, epigenetics is so much more than just a projection of trauma, a genetic project, projection of trauma. But the source of many poor health outcomes people experience, including heart disease, type two diabetes, lupus, asthma, and more. While epigenetics is not some racial phenomenon, the unique experience of the found, of foundational blacks in this country definitely magnifies the epigenetic impact. I discovered that one of the greatest influences in the development of many types of cancers epigenetics through environmental stress and acute stack trauma. 
tra traumatic events are what we call complex trauma. My work in this area led to an invitation to speak at the Epigenetics Cancer Research Society's Epigenetic Congress in 2017. Now, I'm now cancer expert, but I spent so much time in studying it. I learned how epigenetics are literally down-regulating your immune system ge genetics and up-regulating and turning on and elevating disease genes. And so many genes have to, so many cancer genes have to be turned on for a specific type of cancer to happen and we'll get into that so then he goes I was only beginning, I would stumble upon the subcategory of epigenetics now referred to as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. While there are more than 10 ACEs, the ones listed in the image provided, and you'll see the images flowing, uh, I named them yesterday. Um, matter of fact, uh, I, I named them yesterday. Well, I got stuff sitting all around here. Might as well go through them real quickly here. Physical abuse, each one is an ACE. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, alcoholic or parent or addicted to any substance, incarcerated family member, the disappearance of a parent through divorce, death or abandonment, a family member diagnosed with a mental illness, a mother who is a victim of domestic violence. Those are the 10 that are normally counted and have the most Im uh, preeminent impact. So. While there are more than 10 ACEs, the ones listed in the image are the, uh, the most prevalent and are used to create mm -hmm. ACE scores for individuals. What, you should, what should be alarming is one in six people have at least four ACEs. One in six people having four ACEs. And now that, that's going to be important when I start explaining things to you. 61% of adults have experienced at least one ACE. Females and certain racial and ethnic groups are at higher risk of reaching four ACEs. This fact is important because when you reach an ACE score of four, you are two and a half times more likely to develop pulmonary obstructive disease, two and a half times more likely to develop hepatitis, four and a half times more likely to develop depression, 12 times more likely to experience suicide, suicidality. That means attempting suicide, which a score with an ACE score of seven or more, you triple the risk of lung cancer and uh, are three times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in the U.S. It is important to understand that outcomes are dose dependent, meaning that the higher the exposure to the stresses, the more devastating the health outcomes. In other words, it's just not how many ACEs you have. It's how intensely they are impacting your life and how frequently you're exposed to them. So even in the sense of, OK, we could say four ACEs. One person may have four ACEs, but it was spread out over time or it happened in one acute moment and then things change. Another one could have had four ACEs and literally lived their entire childhood being impacted by those four ACEs. That child's outcomes is going to be far worse than the child who had the acute situation. So that's that situation. Why epigenetics influence on adults is significant. ACEs are even greater than a greater threat to ch uh, children who are still developing. Uh, and here's why. ACEs negatively impact the nucleus accumbens. This is the pleasure reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance abuse. This is how people get addicted. They inhibit proper function of the prefrontal cortex. This is where we deal with what? Our impulse control, our reasoning, our decision making, and so much more. We call it the executive function of the brain. Um, the MR skies, M M MRI scans reveal ACE impact the amygdala. The brain's fear response center. Furthermore, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is negatively impacted, disrupting the body's fight or flight response system. And I can go on and on and on. So let's talk about the fight or flight. So the fight or flight is this point in which the body's natural system that's designed, uh, that's a part of the limbic system, a part of 
uh, our ancient brain, the most ancient part of our brain that's designed for total uh, survival. If you want to know why people don't do the things that are necessary to advance themselves, to elevate themselves, to move to higher levels in life, uh, because everything that calls for elevation calls for risk. You got to put some skin in the game. The problem is, at our very prim at our very primal and primitive level, the game is survival. The limbic system, the oldest part of the brain. If that part of the brain is what's controlling you, you won't take uh, you won't take action. You won't make moves. You won't take risks. Why? Because you're in survival mode. So the goal is to stay as far away from anything that can harm me as possible. So I'm not going to get out there because I could lose my job. I'm not going to get out there because I could literally, you know, fail at business. I'm not going to get out there because I might not make the team. I'm not. I mean, and on and on and on. And so you literally are acting functioning almost in flight fight or flight about almost everything it's what i call uh the mountain lion uh coming home and what i mean by that say for instance you're out in the woods and you are moving around and you come across a mountain lion immediately the hair on your neck is going to stand up you're going to trigger a fight or flight response messages are going to be sent to the adrenal gland the adrenal gland is going to release cortisol and adrenaline and what's going to happen? Your heart rate's going to elevate. You're going to start to sweat. Your heart's pumping like this. And all of a sudden, the prefrontal cortex shut down, shuts down. Why is that? Because the prefrontal cortex is where you have, again, your impulse control, your reasoning, your rationale, your decision making. It requires a lot of oxygen and blood flow. So 30% of your blood flow at any given time while you are in a full, fully conscious state is right there. So what happens? That shuts down because that blood flow and that oxygen needs to go where? To your extremities. Why? Because I'm about to fight or run. And so what happens when that, the way I can think and reason has been limited? I'm in complete survival mode. Now, here's the problem. In that mode, when I'm out there and there's a mountain lion, it gives me a, at least a fighting chance to get away or to defend myself enough to where the cat says, look, leave him alone. He's, he's scrappy. Whatever. It has happened. Uh, you'd be surprised at what this high levels of adrenaline will do for you. It's, it's, it's really, truly survival. I've, I've heard of people lifting cars off their kids. I've heard of all kind of crazy stuff in this, but it's short lived. It's meant to literally get you through a moment and then you're supposed to come down. And when you come down, when you get away or you defeat whatever it is that's trying to harm you, your heart rate drops your prefrontal cortex opens up and you say, man, wow, that was a crazy experience. Now, this is something that I learned in studying trauma too. The more involved you're in, the more involved you are in surviving your trauma, trauma, traumatic experience, the less likely you are to be traumatized by it. Uh, in other words, in other words, the more helpless you feel when you're being traumatized, the more likely that trauma sticks, the more likely it imprints, the more likely it creates these epigenetic tags that we're talking about. But for those people who you ever wonder how people go through the same thing, one person looks like nothing's bothering them and they're going through it because actually the way the mind is processing that, if I participated in me surviving this, I'm a hero. If I participate in me surviving this, I've got power. If I'm participating in me surviving this, I'll be okay in the future. But if I could not get myself out of this, if I didn't have the power to save myself now, where am I? And so, again, the sense of helplessness is so devastating in this. And so we have to pay attention to that as well, right? But here's the thing, though. This short 30-second to 90-second period where you you're in face to face with this mountain lion right that's a natural process of fight or flight elevations of cortisol and adrenaline in the bloodstream no big deal you're built for that body can take it you, you you get out you go you go away what happens when you take the mountain lion home with you every day this is called chronic stress this is because the environments you're in are the ones stressing you this is because either I'm going into a home where dad and mom are fighting all the time. I'm going into a home where I might get there and the the the, the, the uh, utilities are turned off. I'm going into a home or I'm going to a school where, you know, I'm going to be bullied. I'm going to a school where the teacher's going to marginalize me and try to make me feel stupid and dumb. And all of these things are things that my little brain can't 
control. Now, let me be very clear. While I'm talking about it in the perspective of a child, the same thing happens to you as an adult. You get up and you go to a, a job you hate. Mountain lion. All day. And you get ready to go home. And then you got a situation at home where the kids are driving you nuts and you and your mate are not on good terms. Mountain lion. You're taking the mountain lion home. You're taking the mountain lion to work. Those cortisol levels are peaking. Your prefrontal cortex is being racked open and shut and you're trying to make yourself focus you don't know why you can't focus you don't know why this is happening it's because you're in a constant state of stress you are literally walking around with something in your bloodstream that was meant to be short-lived and in long prolonged periods of time cortisol wreaks havoc on the organs especially the heart the liver the kidneys And what you end up doing is becoming ill. At the same time, this same stress is upregulating what? Disease genes. This is where sicknesses come from. Disease genes. You, you, you heard some of the things that I read as far as the numbers of, you know, I mean, cancer ischemic heart disease people are dying from stress and then when it comes to blacks it's trauma related stress when it comes to kids these aces what 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 you see is these aces like i said four aces and your entire life changes not just now, through the course of your life, you're more likely to experience these things. This is why I work so hard to try to create environments to help people soften the experience at home for children, soften the experience at home for their mates, especially men. You got to understand, ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Men live on a 24 hour cycle. What does that mean? That means you live on a 28-day cycle. We live on a 24-hour cycle. We go through our entire cycles literally every day. We wake up, and our cycles are uh, highly testosterone-driven. So we wake up, that's when our testosterone is at its highest. That's when our libido is at its highest. That's when we're most aggressive. That's when we're ready to go out and tackle the world. Uh, we are highly, highly aggressive, highly engaged, and we are in hunt mode. And... And then if you ever wonder why dude is always ready to go in the morning, you can't get him to do jack at night. This is why his, his, his in the morning, his testosterone levels are at his highest. He's the king. He's roaring. He's ready to go. And he goes out there. This is the time just to really be aggressive and you go get him. Uh, gets around midday. Testosterone levels drop some. Still aggressive. Still got enough energy. And oh, testosterone is highly related to male energy. So he's very energetic, ready to go, and all that. That's guys. Also, why it's probably best to do your workout in the morning. Okay. So then, here we go. We go through this process. He's right midday, right? And drop down. This is a good time for him. Ten o'clock, two o'clock to start doing what? Making decisions. Why? He's not as aggressive, so his decisions aren't so heavily. Uh, moved by his natural aggression to take, take, be in control, but more along the lines of logic and reason. Then he starts to get towards the end of the day when it's almost time to get off of work, decline again. And now this is the unwind time. He doesn't have a whole lot of energy, testosterone level dry. The last thing he wants to do is engage any type of drama, any type of stress, any type of, he wants to come in, he wants to kick back. Now, this is the beautiful thing, ladies, if you understand his love language, if you understand what's going on, he's going to be more inclined to cuddle because he's actually vulnerable. He does, He's not going to communicate that to you because we don't want to say that, that, and that's probably not how we would, but he wants you up under him because now you are literally, the warmth of your respect, your love, and your care is what actually is giving him his security at the time. Now, guys... Our women are on a 28-day cycle, basically a four-week cycle, and it starts out with the, the, the cycle where they are releasing everything and everything is coming out. I'm not going to be too graphic, but they're coming out, and this is when they're very emotional, 
very hostile and then they go through another cycle uh that they move up and the estrogen levels start to climb and then they get to a pure cycle and then they get to ovulation and each one of these cycles are different and you have to understand your mate to understand how to deal with them in each one of those cycles but when we're dealing with this understand stress management is the thing women at certain points of that cycle are going to be highly discerning they're going to be at their spiritual height they're going to be able to see things hear things feel things that they don't normally do this is normally in the third uh uh third phase and the fourth phase they're on point uh and then they'll get real moody and emotional as they start to drift back into the first phase where they're starting to get rid of everything that they picked up and they're detoxifying and so all of these things are extremely important in understanding but we have to be able to understand that there's got to be this place that we can go home is supposed to be a sanctuary for the children and for the parents it needs to be a sanctuary if there's a whole lot of volatility in the home where is the rest coming where's the recuperation coming where's the feeling of safety coming where is it that we can come together and actually be okay we've got to be able to do that we've got to be able to create that we've got to get outside of ourselves but here's the problem we're living in a world that is pushing individuality we're living in a world that is pushing uh, what what do I get? I, it, it's about me, what I want. And so no one wants to give. No one is ready to sacrifice. Everybody's pointing the finger at who's screwing up and who's not doing what. And nobody is sitting up saying, we've got to build this together. We've got to do this together. Now, that's not just in the home. That's in the community. That's not just in the community. That's uh, in, the, in the collective on a national level. We've got to become aware of how we're going to protect ourselves. They're not going to do it. They created it. They're not going to fix it. It's our responsibility to sit up and say, hey, look, we've got a problem. And this is just one area. This is one, just one area. Uh, this is just one chapter in this book. But it, it, it's huge. And so then what are we going to do? We are going to have to have a better understanding. We need more research, way more research. Uh, we need uh, more resources. We need to be able to deal with this. We need to have a national uh, network that allows us to deal with the children in our communities that are in situations where they're at a high risk for having multiple ACEs. Some things are unavoidable, unavoidable, but you can't consistently expose black children to the level of negative, uh, uh, negative influences, stresses, and stressors that are setting them up for failure in the future not just in their performance but in their health it's our responsibility to come to an understanding of just how powerful this force is the beautiful thing about it is on the flip side of it epigenetics is actually a neutral dynamic i've talked about the negative side of it but the the positive side of it is epigenetics is the explanation of how we heal ourselves we heal ourselves by removing ourselves from what negative stressful environments putting ourselves in peaceful places where we can literally envision better lives for ourselves, set out plans for ourselves and slowly move towards those plans and experience life without threat. What happens? Immediately the body starts to work on healing itself. Those diseased de genes will downregulate in peaceful environments because there's no cortisol to feed it. <laughs> So then that's the thing we need to be creating. That's the thing we need to be doing. Am I saying that, uh, you know, the whole nutrition thing is, a, is, is overhyped? No. Nutrition is extremely important. Nutrition is what gives the body its fuel to be able to do what it does. But the absence of stress is what creates the environment that allows it to do it. You remove the stress and you feed the body what it needs and the body will do what it does. We were designed to heal ourselves. That when we are truly taking care of ourselves, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, there's no need for psychotropic drugs to control behavior. There's no need for synthetic drugs to stop this symptom and that symptom. That's another thing we got to get away from, treating symptoms versus dealing with causality and origin. We have to stop that. So. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down now. It's been 40 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down again.
if you believe in the work that we're doing at the Odyssey Project, if you want to see the research go further, if you want to see more programs uh, implemented, if you want to see us take the programs that are already implemented and and take them further, one of the, there are a number of different things that need to be on the national level that we need to be operating and doing. Uh, look in the description box, click the link, and give. Give uh, understanding that this work doesn't just come because I want it to. It comes at a price. Uh, I'm willing to get out and do everything. I'm willing to give my whole life to this thing if that was a way to do that. Uh, but I've given so much of myself over the last 30 plus years, over 80 hours, over 80,000 hours just in understanding the black dynamic. That isn't anything else I've done. And if you start doing the numbers, I'm talking about that's a full time job over the last 30 years. Do the math. I've literally put that kind of time in. When you're sleeping, I'm still going. I'm doing my business, but then I'm de I'm here. Why? Because somebody has to. Because I can't sit up and say somebody else will do it. I can't sit up and pass the buck and say it'll figure itself out. It hasn't figured itself out in 400 years. We are actually worse off now than we were in the 60s in so many of the ways that really truly should matter to us. The black family is disintegrating. More and more of our children over the last 60 years have been born into single parent households increasingly as time passed. Not accident, that was engineered. That's our responsibility to in intercept and disrupt the engineering that harms us. We are the responsible, we were responsible for protecting our values, interests, and principles, not those who literally benefit from our demise. That's our responsibility. So on that note, look, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. Again, if you believe in the work we're doing, if you want to see us take this thing further, if you want to see a difference made, click on the description box um, and find a way to give. There are multiple ways that you can do this. Find the way that works best for you and give. On that note, look, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day and I will talk to you soon. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.